Hey, everybody, and welcome to another episode of React Native Radio. This week, I'm your host, Charles Max Wood. I'm just going to do a quick call out. I am working on maxcoders.io. A lot of people are asking me questions about how to build careers, how to be successful, you know, the life hack stuff. All of that uh, I'm putting together in a membership site, um, hoping to give you a ton of great stuff. Anyway, go check it out, maxcoders.io. Uh, we have a special guest this week, and that's Lucas Bento. Lucas, do you want to say hello? Sure. Hello. I'm Lucas. I've uh, been working for Active for about uh, four years, and I've uh, been enjoying it a lot so far. Nice. Infinite Red is a U.S.-based consultancy specializing in React and React Native. They do mobile app and web design and development. They are deeply involved in the React and React Native open source communities, publish the React Native newsletter with 10,000 subscribers, and are involved with the React Native core development. If you have a project and need design or engineering help from an experienced team to take it all the way from concept to completion, get in touch with Infinite Red. Also check out Chain React, the React Native conference, which is hosted by Infinite Red in July in Portland with 500 developers from all around the world. You can find them at infinite.red. Make sure to mention you heard about them in this ad. So uh, who, who do you work for? I work for Non-Dutch. It's a small agency in the Netherlands. Cool. So we're, we brought you on to talk about uh, React, upgrading React Native with the doctor command on the React Native CLI. Do you want to just give us a little bit of background there um, as far as like why this matters and maybe what the pain points are in upgrading React Native? Sure. Uh, so just one thing, uh, the doctor comment is something separate from the upgrading. Oh, okay. So um, maybe you want to cut it out or whatever. So uh, the pain points of uh, upgrading a little bit before um, the upgrade helper was that we didn't really know what to change. Uh, we have we had the RN diff purge repository, which showed the diff between two versions. And then uh, we wanted to take this uh, a little step further and then uh, to manipulate the diff a little bit to showcase it better to the users. So we created the upgrade helper. I think it was on the on the release uh, 0 0.60. Uh, we've been getting a lot, uh, uh, a very good uh, uh, feedback so far from the from the people, from the contributors and the maintainers. Uh, basically, we just uh, created an app with the version 0 0.60 and one with the version before that, and we compare each other and show on the interface. We reorder a little bit between the uh, the files, and uh, we also add some comments and uh, some useful content at the top, which shows the user how to upgrade their apps properly. Gotcha. So, what does the Doctor command do, and how does that play into this? Uh, well, the Doctor command is not uh, entirely related. Well, it's not related to the upgrading itself, but it can be helpful at some point. Uh, on the CLI, on the 0 0.60, we also launched the React Native upgrade, and that command it automatically it automatically upgrades our app. Uh, Sometimes it can fail a little bit, so we, we point the user to the upgrade helper on the website. But what it's supposed to do is that it upgrades everything. And then we can also run the Docker command after that, which will check your software installations uh, and everything that may be failing or not, and it automatically fixes them. So it's not related to right. the upgrading, but it can help with that as well. Yeah, it sounds like the brew doctor command for uh, homebrew where yeah, it yeah. goes in and it says, this package is broken. This package is fine. This package is broken, right? And then you can go yeah. in and you can tell it to fix the issues. I think NPM has similar features. So that that makes a lot of sense. So yeah, so ha has the upgrade story gotten better with React Native over the years? Because uh, it seems like sometimes the upgrades come through and everybody just kind of goes, yeah, I upgraded. And sometimes the upgrade comes through and everybody goes, that was awful. <laughs> yeah. I think this is still happens. It still happens a lot, especially for people that are just beginning with React Native. Uh, usually when you're beginning with React Native, you don't really know how the native part works and then you have to uh -huh. upgrade it and then you're just lost. Uh, I would say it has become better on the past few months. Uh, we still have a long road to go, but we are constantly uh, discussing and uh, raising new ideas talking with the contributors, with the maintainers on whatever we can uh, improve on that part. It's, it's still a little bit hard to come up with tools and uh, tooling around it. But uh, yeah, we are getting there. It's better than it was uh, a while ago, at least. Right. So so I'm kind of imagining, and, and just to give you a little bit of context, I am planning on diving in a little bit more on React Native because I plan to use it to build an app for devchat.tv and that way people can get the episodes and I can, you know, I can give them a little bit more than they get off of the RSS feed 
and maybe a little bit less or the same as what they get off the website, but they have it on their web, their phone. I can send them push notifications. There are a lot of reasons to do it. But um, I bought a template app a while ago and I don't believe that it's been upgraded. So I can imagine I get in and you know I'm three, four versions old on the installation, right? So I go and I, you know, maybe I do an NPM install or I open up the React Native CLI and I upgrade, you know, I run some upgrade commands there um, and I get rolling. And then you know, you, what, what's the process I'm going to run through to get that up to date before I really dive in and get working on it? So it depends on the version that you have on the template right now. Uh, if you are on the 59, I believe, we introduced the React Native Upgrade. I'm not entirely sure which version it is, mm -hmm. uh, but then you can just run React Native Upgrade, wait a little bit and see if the, everything was successful. If there were some fails, some fails on the on their terminal and then you can just check the upgrade helper and then apply the diff manually. So it really depends on the version you are in. I think if you are jumping, try not to jump between a lot of versions. Always try to be like, if you are on the 57 right now, you need to upgrade to 61. Try to do a jump from 57 to 58, 58 to 59, and uh, yeah. onwards, because it's easier to catch if you like uh, if you had a bug or uh, something that's not working, you can search it easily, and then uh, you also know which version is failing. Yeah, that makes sense. I've seen that with a lot of technologies, actually. I mean, some some of them seem to go way out of their way to um, make it. What's the word I'm looking for? They, they go out of their way to make it so that it's approachable, right? You know, you can upgrade from, you know, sort of a minor-ish version to a, a rather major version. And then others, they tend to take the tactic a little bit more of where they, uh, you know, they, they don't worry so much about the older versions. They're mostly concerned with the, you know, the newer or current version. And so, you know, yeah, moving up one version at a time is actually the way to go because you just never know what you're going to end up with otherwise. So, so what you're recommending is, yeah, you move up one version at a time. They, you, yeah. you don't get easy upgrade paths necessarily between like two or three versions. Yeah, I would say yes. Um, I think maybe be, uh, starting on the 60, maybe it gets better. Uh, before the 60 release, we had uh, uh, we needed to manually link not native packages, and those are the ones that broke the most. I would say uh, uh, right now it's easier to link them because it's an automatic link with uh, uh, the CLI right. and the core. So yeah, perhaps it's it's a little bit better to upgrade between versions right now. All right, so let's say that I am on one of those older versions. Um, what approach do you recommend there? So I, I just run the upgrade command and basically just check my app for errors, see if it still compiles. Yeah, that's uh, that's the way to go. That's that's how I usually do it. I just keep trying to build and fixing whatever the console or Xcode or Android Studio shows me. So if I there is you. an error, I just try to Google it, uh, try to fix it, try to pinpoint if it's a library, if it's a core, basically uh -huh. just uh, try and never. That makes sense. So what kinds of problems do you typically run into then? I mean, will it, are you usually going to run into something where it is going to fail to compile or is it going to run and you're going to, you know, reach some error state that's going to be ugly? Mm, that's, uh, that's tricky. I think it's usually uh, the integration with libraries. Uh, ah, that sometimes, makes sense. Yeah, sometimes you want like, uh, I don't know, for instance, the 61 just came in and it has fast refresh, which is something that the community was asking for so long. Uh, so everyone uh, just upgraded as soon as it as it came out, mm -hmm. and then a bunch of libraries don't. For instance, there is a breaking change, and a bunch of libraries didn't update yet because there was no time. Right. So it's usually with uh, libraries. With libraries that we have on the React Native community, usually we can uh, update uh, before the release is actually out because we know what kind of stuff is actually going to be on the release, uh, and we know beforehand when the release is going to be done. But uh, with libraries that are like for outside maintainers or stuff like that, uh, it takes a little bit more time. Right. Gotcha. So what does the upgrade helper do? Uh, the upgrade helper is just uh, it's just a web interface. It shows uh, tutorials, comments, uh, usually stuff that can help you out on the process of upgrading your, your uh, application. So you just choose from what version you're coming, for instance, uh, 59, and uh, to which version you want to upgrade to. Let's say for 0.621, which is the latest one. Uh, we will show uh, the change log, 
between those two versions. Uh, if there's a more if there's two versions jump, we show the two change logs. Uh, we mentioned we have comments on uh, on a few lines teaching you how to upgrade that part. Like on the 60, we had some major things that we needed to change on the Xcode UI, mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, uh, then my uh, co maintainer he wrote a guide with how you can uh, just uh, drag and drop some stuff, delete a few there, uh, add other ones uh, to get your build to to work. Cool. So you're one of the maintainers then on the upgrade helper. Yeah, I am together with uh, Lorenzo Siandra and uh, Pablo Vineratos. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, we've had Lorenzo on the show before. Yeah. Yeah, I got to practice my Italian for two minutes before we got going. So. Yeah, I feel the same thing. I hope I hope him, I, I I pronounce his name right. <laughs> yeah. So uh, w what's coming next in the upgrade helper then? So for the helper per se, we don't really have much stuff on the backlog for now. Uh, mm -hmm. I would say the one that I'm mostly looking forward to do is uh, implementing dark mode. Uh, I started a little bit when I, I was looking for stuff to do. It's pretty fun to build it because uh, it's a little bit hard to work with TIFFs on dark mode in a way that it looks like uh, presentable. Uh, right. But right now I'm working on another initiative for the upgrading part. Uh, and that was uh, created, proposed by Eli White from Facebook. And that's uh, just a discussion forum for people that are upgrading or already upgraded their apps. Basically, we want a safe place where people can open issues or uh, reporting problems that they have with the upgrading and uh, uh, asking how they can solve them. And uh, also the same place with people that can help with those problems or can just post a solution. Like uh, I have a problem with my something on JavaScript not working. They just specify there what the problem is and how they solved it. So right. later on, we can uh, gather those issues or uh, the solutions or questions with Upgrade Helper and show them on the UI when you are uh, upgrading your app. Yeah, it almost sounds like a Stack Overflow type forum. Kind of like that, yeah. But then uh, it would be, we, oh, this is just an initiative, like we are uh, just trying to see how that will look like. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's, it's kind of like that, yeah. Very cool. So how did you get involved in the project? Um, I think it was on the React Native, on the RN diff purge from uh, Pavlo. So he had to do, initially he wanted to do some stuff for the for the web version of it. I would say mm -hmm. in the beginning, it was a little bit hard to find it. So you need to go to the GitHub and then you need to go into a, a diff on the GitHub page with, between branches. So we wanted to build something that looked like the Angular project. They have like, a, a, if, if you don't know, it's update.angular.io. And there you just select two versions and you have a step-by-step -step of what you can do. Oh, sorry, yep. what you need to do when upgrading your app. We wanted to do the same thing. So we started doing the same thing as they do. But it would be really hard to have that for React Native because uh, it would take a little bit it would take a little bit time after the release was done because we needed to write like each step down, which takes quite some time. Right. So we just wanted to leverage the same thing that we have on the RN diff purge repository uh, into a web interface that was uh, easier to to read and also could gather a bunch of content in one place. Makes sense. So did you start the project then or did somebody else start it? Uh, I started together with Pavlos and uh, Lorenzo. Okay. So it was... It was kind of all of you together. Yeah, yeah, I would say, yeah. Nice, and uh, is it, so it's all under the React Native community Git, GitHub? Yeah, it's all under the same org. So okay. it's, it, it's really easy for other uh, maintainers and contributors on the React Native community to contribute to each other projects. Right, yeah, that makes sense. I think I think we talked about that with uh, Lorenzo or somebody, yeah, what that was did, and how it works. Yeah, he did a ton of work for uh, the React Native organization. And uh, a lot of managing as well. Cool. So, what 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 does your day job look like then, as far as you know what you're uh, you know doing with React Native there? Uh, so, I'm working in a client. Uh, the company is named Tele2. It's a telecom provider in the Netherlands. Uh, I work in the customer facing app. Uh, it's nothing fancy there. We've been using I think React Native since the beginning of the project there. Uh -huh. And uh, it's just a, a basic app where it shows the usage that you have, the uh, SMS usage, calls, uh, internet data, all this kind of stuff. I, I like it a lot because we have a lot of crazy animations, I would say. 
the target of the tele of tele show is mostly like people that uh, like different stuff. So we have uh, a very uh, difficult animations here and there, uh, a lot of fancy transitions. So yeah, that's kind of my day job. Nice. Um, is there anything more to the upgrades that I haven't asked you about? I mean, we've kind of gone rather quickly and I don't know if I've missed, you know, anything critical or important. Uh, to upgrades, I'm not sure actually. I think that's that's pretty much it. I can't really think of anything else. So it sounds like it's pretty straightforward until you run into some hiccup with the libraries yeah. you're integrating with or... Yeah, basically, yeah. It's really easy when you look from the outside, uh, but you just know the real pain from it when you actually do it. Yeah. So that's that's mostly why we wanted to have the uh, the discussion forum, which we're calling upgrade support, mm -hmm. uh, where, because what happened with me a lot is that uh, I upgrade my app and then after fixing build issues or like just running straightforward, something like that. Uh, I sent to my QA and my QA comes back with some dark problem, which I have no idea how to fix. Uh, mm -hmm. So I just start uh, trying to find a issues or content or anything like that on the internet, which right. takes some, some good amount of time. So hopefully yeah, the upgrade support will help with that. Yep. Especially if they're not using the same terms you are. It gets yeah, that's really true. tricky to figure that out. That's true. Yeah. That's, uh, I think that's how you get better at uh, searching. You just uh, guess how this could, uh, well, the best keywords when searching. Yep. If you have anything, everything is centralized and it's, much easier for you to find your the solution to our issue. Yeah, absolutely. So have you done much upgrading of React Native apps or? I would say, yeah. I have done a lot of stuff like that. Uh, I do enjoy it. Like I, I like to fix the whatever problems arise. I like, I think I learn a lot from them, mm -hmm. especially when they're related to libraries because sometimes they have problems, a lot of problems with linking and the uh, native stuff don't work, but uh, the JavaScript works. So it's uh, right. messy, but I like, I like it. Right. So typically what you're going to see is if you run into a problem, it's going to be like uh, Cocoa Pods or some other native library that you're running into hiccups with. It's just not connecting well. Yeah, I would say, yeah. Like you have build issues or runtime issues. Yep. Now are those stuff. tricky to track down? Because it seems like, you know, you could really run into some goofy stuff as far as, you know, it's not really, if you're a JavaScript developer, it's not really your area of expertise, right? Yeah, I agree with that. I remember that in the beginning, it was, uh, it wasn't, it was very difficult for me. Uh, I remember that uh, my first big thing that I had to do was uh, I needed to link and fix some issues with uh, with Firebase. We weren't even using React Native Firebase. I think it was uh, React Native FCM that we needed just the push notifications part. And it right. took so much time to do it because it's it's really a much uh, an environment completely different from what you have on the web. So. It's hard to search. It's hard to uh, understand the build issues that you have. Sometimes they are just very cryptic that come from iOS uh, or CME. Right. So yeah, it's uh, in the beginning it's, it's a little bit difficult. After some time, you just get uh, just get much used to the terminology and uh, all the errors right. that you, they get. Back when we were starting up new shows, one of the shows that got started was Views on View, and one of the things that was really fun about that is that I got to know a bunch of really terrific people in the Vue community. And furthermore, one thing that happened that really hadn't happened on any of the other shows, we actually got a member of the core team to come on as a regular panelist on the show. We have Chris Fritz on there. The other thing is, is you may recognize some of the other voices. Ben Hong, who's on the official Vue News podcast, is also a panelist on the show. He's worked for Politico and now works for GitLab. We also have a bunch of other terrific panelists that come on and talk to you about what's going on in the Vue community. And because they're so closely tied to Vue and they talk to people about Vue all the time, they're very up-to-date and very knowledgeable about what's going on in the Vue community. So if you're looking for a way to learn Vue.js or if you're looking for a way to stay current with Vue.js and kind of have the water cooler conversations you wish you could have about it in places where maybe they're not using it, then definitely check it out. You can find it at viewsonview.com. So when you upgrade, I guess the other thing is, is, you know, if you're running some upgrade uh, command, does it go in and actually check your native dependencies and make sure that those are going to get upgraded too? Um, no. 
so the React Native upgrade is actually uh, it works pretty shallowly, I would say. I hope uh -huh. this is right. Uh, it just it just gets the same diff that you have on the private helper. So uh, the diff of the React Native in it, so the initial uh, project that uh, you created, and it applies to your current project. So it's right. very minimal. It's uh, it's as minimal as, as it can be, I would say. And you can you you still need to read the change log to understand what breaking changes you have or, or what stuff has been changed that you need to change, uh, and also update our libraries if needed or check our right. build issues. So the Rec Native upgrade actually just works like very bare bones to just get everything that you have on the the uh, on the new release into your project and then the rest with you. Okay, gotcha. So yeah, so all of those native dependencies, that's part of the why it makes it so hard is because those native dependencies are not handled by the upgrade command. No, it's not. Yeah, that's a, that's a tricky thing. We want in the future to have some tool that can uh, um, automatically upgrade your dependencies uh, and uh, whatever files you have, like Xcode, uh, the project part, mm -hmm. uh, the same for Android. Uh, but that's uh, that's still in discussion and we are still trying a lot of stuff. Pavel is working a lot on this and uh, he's uh, trying to see what uh, he can get from that. No, that makes sense. Yeah, we have a lot of initiatives to, upgrade, to, to improve the upgrade process. We just need to get around to doing them. We yeah. have a lot of a lot of ideas, a lot of uh, projects. We just need time, basically. Yeah, that's pretty normal, especially when it's on a volunteer basis, like most of this stuff is going to be. Yeah, yeah. Everything that we're doing for the upgrade currently is uh, community based. Yep. Cool. Well, I don't know if there's anything else to really dive into here. Do you have any resources that you recommend to people for kind of getting rolling with this if they're brand new to it? I mean, you uh, mentioned the great. forum and things, but yeah. I would say in the next few weeks, we will be launching the upgrade support, uh, the forum mm -hmm. for discussing uh, the the versions, the upgraded versions. So uh, as a user, I would I will be really looking forward to that. I think that's pretty much it. There are also, there are always uh, some upgrading um, tutorials that uh, people are just creating. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes I, I read them and I also put them on the upgrade helper as a link, as a reference. Mm -hmm. We're also trying to gather other uh, people like editors or people that, uh, that want to actually create tutorials uh, so we can link them on the Upgrade Helper for people to read them. So right. if anyone is listening and uh, that's someone that uh, likes to create tutorials or posts about, about Upgrade, I would be very happy to include those posts on the Upgrade Helper. Right. We Super can, cool. Yeah. We could also talk about the React Native Doctor, which is separate from the Upgrade part. Yeah, let's do that. Let's let's talk about the uh, React Native Doctor. I mean, what kinds of problems is it going to find? Um, so uh, the React Native Doctor started as a, an issue from a, a user of the React Native CLI. Um, and the example that uh, they were using was from the Flutter, actually. So basically, it searches, it checks the Cocoa Pods, uh, libraries that we use internally, mm -hmm. your Android versions, SDK, few environment variables, check some other stuff like a very minimal to what a React Native project needs to run. Uh, and then checks if those versions, they actually match what we support, what the React Native CLI supports. And then if they doesn't, we run a few health checks, which will try to automatically fix them. If not possible, then we log a few messages on the UI uh, explaining where and how you can actually fix those issues. Right. So we are in a experimental phase right now with React Native Doctor, and we expect to launch it um, in the next couple of weeks. Right, and that's also part of the same uh, React Native community organization on GitHub? Yes, it's actually uh, on the CLI itself, on the CLI that we already have. Oh, okay. So we ex I expect that in the next couple of weeks, you can just type React Native Doctor and that will just fix the problems that you have on your installation. Oh, that'd be nice. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Dear CLI, solve my problems for me. Thank you. Yeah, kind of like that. I'm uh, I'm focusing a lot on the UI of that as well because in the beginning it, it looks a little bit tricky. At least I don't know how is your experience with this kind of stuff on the on doctor or health checks, but uh, they usually look pretty awful, and you can't really understand what's being printed out. Uh, it's usually 
uh, you just copy this kind of stuff and put on a, on an issue and uh, wait for someone to reply with what your issue is. Uh, and then I try to create something like very that looks nice, but at the same time is also very useful to you. Yeah, that's the trick, right? Is that yeah? You a lot of times you get this arcane, um, you know, this thing's not installed at blah 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 blah, and it's it's like I I, I don't even know what to do with that. Yeah, basically, yeah. So I uh, I the UI is inspired a lot by Jest. I don't know if you know the Jest watch mode yep. where you can just you have the usage and then you can just uh, type like a W and then it cleans up the entire output of your terminal and then redo everything again. It's kind of like that. Uh, that part was uh, was nice for me because I could learn how it is done. I never worked with stuff like this, like an interactive CLI. Uh -huh. uh, it was pretty cool to build. It looks nice as well. Nice. It sounds like there's a lot going on here in this organization, and it's it's always good to see the community kind of pulling together and supporting tools like this. Um, if people want to contribute to any of these tools or ideas, do do you have a best practice for getting involved or um, best practice uh i would say just uh checking out the issues on the cli there are a bunch of stuff that can be worked on we have some we have some stuff on the upgrade help as well so just come into there ask if it's taking or not if anyone is working on it or not and then uh, if not uh, probably the maintainer will assign it to you and then you can just uh, work on it just open pull requests and uh, mostly don't be afraid of uh, of sending out your code Right. Uh, you get feedback from the maintainer. Uh, just try to figure out the best way to do stuff, and then soon you to get more. I would say it's mostly not being afraid to uh, share your code or your thoughts on on the on the repositories. Uh, the recreative community is very very much open to contributions. Yeah, it's it's interesting that you bring that up as a point. Um, lately, I've gotten involved in the political process here in the United States. And, you know, so I'm an officer in one of the major pol uh, political parties in, in my local area. And what's interesting is, is that, you know, there's, there's all this process and history and things that go into this stuff. And for a long time, I was afraid to, to really push and see what I could, you know, contribute because I felt like I didn't know everything that was going on. And it turned out that that was actually kind of dumb, that everybody else involved is a volunteer too. And that they, you know, a lot of them are in the same boat. And so by jumping in and, um, you know, I, you know, I ask first, right? So it's, hey, you know what, I want to contribute in this way. And then if, you know, if nobody objects, then I move ahead. And a lot of times it makes a difference. And so it's the same thing here, right? Where, you know, you jump in, okay, you know what, I see this problem. Is anyone else working on the problem? Okay, well, can I help you with it? Uh, no, I think I've got it. Okay, well, here are my two cents on it. Uh, is there another project or problem that I can jump in on? You know, go solve the next problem. Yeah, uh, unless you jump in and break things, and typically you don't have the kind of access to jump in and break things until you've contributed a bit. Um, you know, you, you just 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 get in and ask questions and and get involved. and And then after a while, you'll be able to, know enough of the history or the organization of the code or whatever to actually make those kinds of contributions. Yeah, couldn't agree more with that. I think it's exactly what you said. Uh, usually if you jump in and you break something, it's not your fault. And even if it is, like we're all working for free here. We yeah. are just, uh, we're all uh, gathering to help people. So nobody's gonna point fingers at you and say like, oh, you broke this. No, just everyone, we gather together and then just, uh, just fix it. Well, the other thing is, is it's all in Git, right? So you can just roll it back if you have to. Yeah, yeah, exactly that. So, so the stakes are really low and the, the opportunities are terrific, so. Yeah, when I was beginning the, the uh, development or, uh, or open source, I, usually, I used to think that to do open source on the, on the working basis, like a daily basis, I mean, it was mm -hmm. only for people that had, like, were seniors or people that uh, worked uh, a lot on the development field. But today, I just think that you just you just need to want to do open source. You can learn yeah. a lot from it, like a lot, a lot. Like for instance, I did I worked with TypeScript very little. Uh, uh, I think six months ago or something like that on a freelance project. Uh, I've been learning a lot with TypeScript because the CLI is being converted to TypeScript. 
So I'm working more of TypeScript right now on just on an open source project, not on uh, my uh, daily job. So you can yeah, really well, learn a lot from from open source. Yeah, well, you're not actually getting paid to work on TypeScript. And if you spent work time working on it, that, that may not actually make sense. But by having this other opportunity, you have that opportunity now to go learn this new technology. So, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, and then and then you've got this skill so that if something changes in the future, then you can say, well, I actually know TypeScript, so. Yeah, I agree. I also tried to, uh, in the beginning, I used to make everything open source. But like, uh, uh, if I'm working on this for one day, I'm already going to open source or something like that. But uh, nowadays, well, I still try to make open, everything open source by default. But uh, I focus on the stuff that uh, I know that I'm going to use in the future. Because then I have like uh, I have more focus, and I'm going. I know that I, I will still spend time on it. Yeah, uh, I had a lot of trouble uh, with uh, finishing up the projects because I just lose the interest in them. And uh, knowing that I'm going to still keep using it just helps me to finalize them and open source it. Yep. When I'm building a new product, G2I is the company that I call on to help me find a developer who can build the first version. G2i is a hiring platform run by engineers that matches you with React, React Native, GraphQL, and mobile engineers who you can trust. Whether you are a new company building your first product or an established company that wants additional engineering help, G2i has the talent you need to accomplish your goals. Go to devchat.tv slash G2i to learn more about what G2i has to offer. In my experience, G2i is linked up with experienced developers that can fit my budget, and the G2i staff are friendly and easy to work with. They know how product development works and can help you find the perfect engineer for your stack. Go to devchat.tv slash G2i to learn more about G2i. Yeah, I've, I've kind of struggled with some of this too, right? Because there are things that I want to build in the open, but there are things that I don't, I don't necessarily want to open source because they directly affect business. And, mm -hmm. and you know, and so, and for example, I was talking to uh, one of my editors and, you know, he had this idea on how we could make the audio quality better. And, you know, that's a real competitive advantage, you know, going out and providing solutions to podcasters. And so I want to build it in the open. If somebody else wants to go build it on their own based on what I'm putting out there, fine. But I'm not sure I really want to open source it. And so, yeah, I, I kind of made the decision, you know what, I'm probably going to record videos of myself coding this and, you know, provide them to people. But yeah, I'm not going to, you know, I don't necessarily have to open source it, but people can still learn how to take advantage of the technology and ideas behind it and build their own thing. So, you know, and they may not even be building what I'm building. They may be building something that's kind of related that uses some of the same technological ideas, you know, or um, the one app that I want to build is going to be an Electron app. So the same deal there, right? Maybe they'll just get the here's how to build an Electron app and they won't even, you know, be interested in doing what I'm doing, so. Yeah, that's definitely going to help people, yeah. Yeah. Like, uh, you, you talk about Electron, I remember that I looked up for a bunch of sources on how to work with uh, building the build part of Electron, like which solution you use because there, I think there are two or three, that, or three, or three, three mm -hmm. solutions currently that uh, you can build with Electron. And uh, I had a lot of trouble searching which one to use and uh, how to use them. So yeah, definitely would, help with people if you just uh, share the tiny bits of uh, what you're working on. Right. Well, the other thing is, is I can say, hey, this is the app I'm building. This is what it does, but I don't have to give away the whole thing and still be able to help people with it. Yeah. I think anything that you share will help people anyway. Yeah. That's the cool yeah. part of open source. But I, but I know a lot of people that really are on the open source train to the point where if you don't open source your software, they're actually frustrated with you. And as much work as goes into a lot of this stuff, I just, I really have a hard time getting to the place where I can say, yeah, you should make the stuff that you built, the work that you've done free to everybody. Now, I, I, I admire people for doing it and I do it for a lot of other things, but I don't think everything has to be, so. Yeah, I think it depends on you. I think there's yep. no right, no right answer to this. Yeah. Some people just, uh, as you said, like work with uh, everything being open source. Some people don't open source anything, they don't have any interest on open source. So yeah, it really depends on the person. Yeah. I don't think anyone should be public shaming anyone with, uh, uh, if you're not open source in this, you're not good or anything like that. Yeah, I agree. I think um, open source itself can be very, uh, can be a very reward, rewarding mm -hmm. thing to you. 
but it can also be really frustrating. So yeah. in the end, it's up to you, like how you want to deal with, with that. Yep. Yeah. Well, and given the level of burnout and things like that, that I see people go through, I just really have a hard time telling them what they have to do with the work they do. So. Yeah, I agree. Anyway, um, if people want to find you online, Lucas, where do they go? Uh, I would say mostly my GitHub and my Twitter. Uh, the username is different, are different. Uh, on my GitHub, it's uh, Lucas Bento and my Twitter is Ali Bento Silva. Hopefully people will get this right. Yep. Yeah, basically that. You can also check all my projects on GitHub. Good deal. All right. Well, I'm going to go ahead and uh, drive us into picks. Now, I don't know if you've listened to the show, but picks are things that pe- we like that, that you want to shout out about. I mean, we've had uh, TV shows. We have had movies. We've had books. We've had tech. We've had keyboards. I mean, all kinds of stuff. So, you know, music, musical instruments, you know, so whatever kind of gets you going in the morning and gets you excited to be you or things that you're really enjoying. Yeah, th- those are the kinds of things we pick. And I'll go ahead and go first. So um, I've been playing with, and I mentioned at the beginning of the show, Max Coders, and I, I really want to help people out. It seems like when I put the kind of content out that I'm going to be putting on Max Coders, just help people, you know, level up on their career and level up in life and things like that. People respond extremely positively. They, they really, a, a lot of people are really hungry for it. Um, and that's why I'm putting together this membership site. It is basically so that I can justify taking the time away from the other things that make the podcast network run to run this. So um, one of the things that I am diving into and working with is just the membership site setup. And so some of the plugins I'm using, I'm just going to shout out about the devchat.tv site is actually a static site. It's built in 11 But for a membership site, I felt like I needed something a little bit different. I was going to say more robust, but it it just, it has different needs and, and a static site just won't work. Um, or, or if it will, it'll take me way longer to figure it out than just to, you know, kind of go a proven route. So I signed it up, signed, I signed it up. <laughs> I can't even talk today. So I signed up for a, a website and I'll put it in the, the uh, show notes, but it's, it's basically a membership site uh, academy. I can't remember. It might just be membership site academy. I'll, I'll get the link and I'll put it in the show notes. But uh, anyway, it's, it's pretty awesome. And they walk you through how to set up all the technology for it. Yeah, Membership Site Academy. And I have an affiliate link that I'll put in the, the show notes so that you know I can get a kickback if that's what people are looking to do. But they walk you through the whole process of kind of thinking through how you want to organize it. They walk you through the process of setting up WordPress and setting up all the plugins. I'm using MemberPress, which is another uh, pick for me. I, I, I actually know Blair. I know the guy that created MemberPress and he's pretty awesome. And, and he's done a bunch of work. He has another, um, another plugin called Affiliate Royale that you can use to send commissions. But yeah, so I'm using that. I'm also using LearnDash to put together courses because I want to just give people kind of the full treatment. And it's funny too, because like I looked on Pluralsight, I've, I've got a couple of other friends that do different kinds of training and they're all focused on the technology. And I talked to them about these soft skill sites and, 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 you know, as far as like how to succeed, how to do well on your team, things like that. And none of them are interested in publishing courses on it, but I think people really need it. So anyway, so I'm going to be putting together courses. Here's how you communicate well with your team. Here's how you, uh, you know, take a leadership role in your, in your company. And here's how to be a leader, even if you're not quote unquote, the leader, right? So even if you're not assigned to be the team lead and uh, all of this stuff is really critical in my mind, but I need a place to organize it. And that's, that's where this comes together. So anyway, I'll put links to uh, MemberPress and LearnDash in here as well. But yeah, if you're looking at doing a membership site, this really, it, it's kind of a full, fully fledged, complete way of putting this kind of thing together. And I've had a few people ask me about masterminds. That's something that I plan to do probably next year. But I kind of want to get this content out now so that people can get there. And then I'm also on the verge of publishing uh, the Max Coder's Guide to Finding Your Dream Job. So if you're looking for a job or you're not happy with your job, then this will walk you through the process of finding a job that you love. So um, I don't have a link for that right now, but we may just go back and add it in later. Lucas, what are your picks? Uh, So my picks are uh, Upgrade Helper, which is uh, the tool that I created and maintain, and I'm very proud of it. Uh, You can find it on the React Native Community Organization on GitHub and also on the upgrading page explaining how to use it on the React Native documentation. Uh-huh. I'm also very excited to release the React Native Doctor. I've been working on it since July. 
together with uh, other contributors. So really looking forward to it. And uh, I think last week I rewatched it, uh, Avengers Endgame and the movie is really amazing. So I definitely recommend that. Yeah, Avengers Endgame was pretty good. Yeah. I mean, I, I picked apart the plot, but I did enjoy the movie. So, <laughs> Yeah, it, it is pretty cool. I like yeah. all the, how they uh, ended a few characters. Looked really yeah. Nice. Yeah, and it looks like they're kind of... I, I've heard some of the, the writers that have been part of the Marvel Cinematic Universe that we've been watching. And I guess there was like phase one, which were a lot of the early Marvel movies. Phase two was, you know, kind of building towards some of this. Um, you know, where it was the Avengers protecting the planet and stuff like this. This was phase yeah. three. And I guess they have a phase four planned. And so, yeah, they're not going to have some of the characters that uh, died or, you know, kind of faded into the sunset. But um, yeah, they're still going to be making movies. So I, I kind of expect that, you know, we're going to see more uh, Spider-Man movies and Black Panther movies and, you know, some of these other movies, uh, Captain Marvel movies and just see, you know, kind of where things go from here. It should be pretty fun. So, yeah, definitely agree with that. We're really looking forward to that. Yep. All right. Well, thanks for coming and talking to me, Lucas. Yeah. Thank you, man. Thank you a lot. All right, folks, we will wrap this up and we will come back next week with another React Native Radio. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit 